ena mana, ena reo, e rangatira ma, teni te mihi kia koto, i te kaupaparo te rā, tēnā koto, tēnā koto, tēnā rā tato katoa. Good evening, everyone, and what a fantastic turnout. I know there's so many events on tonight, um, and you chose to come here. We've got Festa this weekend. Uh, we've got the um, uh, Becker Heritage Week. You know, there's just so much um, happening, and of course, with uh, Tūranga now opened, uh, I have to say that there is a real vibe in the city that I haven't felt for a long time. So it's uh, it's feeling good. So welcome each and every one of you um, to today. And thank you for being part of this event. The Christchurch Conversations, as you'll know, um, is a series of free public talks that bring us together to hear from interesting people. Now, I have to say that my um, notes did say thought leaders. Uh, I've replaced that with interesting people. Um, because, well, I don't know, it's a bit like learnings, you know, why can't we just say lessons, you know, it's just speak normally. Um, but the, the, idea about, the idea about having interesting people here is that they catalyse a conversation about things that we are passionately interested in, and nothing could be more interesting to Christchurch uh, at the moment than um, placemaking. Um, now, I, I'll do the formal bit, which is Christchurch Conversations are presented by the Christchurch City Council in association with um, Te Putahi, Christchurch Centre for Architecture and City Making, and um, beloved home of FESTA. Um, Christchurch, um, this evening's event is also presented in association with Panuku Development Auckland with support from Razine. And this has been a wonderful opportunity to bring um, Ethan down here to Christchurch. And we've done that with um, a partnering support from Otakaro, which is uh, again, fantastic to have them uh, so um, involved. So, I would like to officially, on behalf of the City of Christchurch, uh, welcome Ethan Kent to Ototahi Christchurch. Um, Ethan is a leader in the global placemaking movement and the Senior Vice President at Project for Public Spaces in New York. And we were having a little bit of a, hi, this is me, this is you, you know, conversation before. And um, I love New York City. And, um, and Ethan was saying there's something about Christchurch at the moment that offers almost a sense of opportunity that isn't available in, in a place like New York today. So uh, I think we're going to have a very, very interesting evening. Um, Ethan has arrived after visiting other parts of New Zealand and supporting placemaking events, activities and learning. Um, he is spending several days here to experience Ototahi, um, including attending Festa this coming weekend. Uh, the title for this evening's talk is Thriving Through Placemaking, so, um, which is great. I like that word, thrive. Thrive has a meaning in the natural um, universe as well as in the sort of human um, kind, and uh, thriving is something that we all um, aspire as a measure of um, prosperity, I think. Well, I do myself. Um, through his uh, presentation, he is going to be talking about creating great places, strong economies, and flourishing communities, um, and will expand our understanding of placemaking as a transformative way of improving cities. Now, as I said before, this is an incredibly timely conversation for our city uh, to be having as we face challenges in continuing to build our economy, attract and retain talent, uh, and create great places for us all to enjoy and be part of. Um, we've, we've got many great examples of place making, making within Christchurch with a wide range of organisations and sectors involved in its success, but are we truly realising the potential or do we even really understand uh, the potential that we have uh, right at this moment? Um, and I'm just going to go, he's worked on over 200 projects in his 20-year career. You want all this? You know, yeah, I mean, look, I know, I sit there and I go, oh, for God's sake, get off the stage and just let me, <laughs> let me get on to it. Um, and he could tell his story so much more, and what we're going to get from him will tell the story. But he really has um, been um, a leader in 
in, in helping people articulate what it is that they need to be talking about and thinking about in order to um, create great places to um, live, work, play and visit. Um, we're very fortunate to have him here and I did pick up one of his quotes so you may be using it in your, in your talk tonight but I thought it was really an interesting place to start. Um, human capital and creative talent increasingly goes where it likes. Talent increasingly goes to great places, but talented people become most attached to places that they help create. Let us explore the opportunity that present us to create, recreate our city. So thank you so much. Wow. Cheers. Um, so interesting people make great places, and great places make interesting people. Placemaking is really about making the language of shaping our world more common sense, making it accessible to everybody. It's just an ongoing conversation of, of how do we best work together? How do we make it most fun, most comfortable? Uh, how do we draw out people's spirit, their power, their and the connection to place that is so deep here in New Zealand, uh, is, is, is in, and, and particularly the, the rediscovery of place, the recreation of place here in Christ Church is uh, so fertile, and not just for what you're creating here, but to me it's, it's, it's been inspiring, the leadership that has been emerging here, uh, and it has the potential to really inspire some of the best new models for city building globally. Um, and, you know, it is, you know it's, not, it's not just, obviously, that people are coming here. You have the best talent here. You have people coming from around the world wanting to be part of this conversation, to contribute to it in various ways. Um, but how it's drawing out the talent that's already here, how it's drawing out that connection in deeper ways. Um, the, you know, I, I've learned this week about the sort of, the, the, some little bits just about the, the Maori culture, and it's so powerful, that the deep connection to place, the questioning about where do your, where do your bones come from, asking people, but where, what, what are your connections to place for many generations? And to, to me, you start to realize how deeply interesting everybody is, how sp deeply special everyone is, um, but also how deeply powerful place is, and how, we, how important it is that we really continue to support and grow this, this, this connection to place, this uniqueness of place, the identity of place. Because um, unfortunately, for, for better or worse, humans are now defining the, the purpose and meaning of place. Uh, and we need to define it obviously with respect and to the past cultures in ways that you know, we're just starting to understand and realize the past meaning of the land. Um, but we need to also define it so it supports thrivability, so it supports the flourishing of, of individual potential, of, um, of, of collective potential, even more importantly. Not just because that's nice and, 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 and sounds good, but because it's, that's the only way we're actually going to achieve the, you know, the, the uh, persistence of humanity on this planet. That's actually how we're going to achieve sustainability. Sustainability isn't enough. We, and there's a lot of things about the, the world that we shouldn't sustain. We need to systemically change things for, for a lot of people to be able to flourish. Not just because it's the right thing to do and it's, it's equal, um, but because that's what's going to build the capacity of people to change the world in ways that we need to. And so a lot of those models, I think, are emerging and have, have been naturally emerging from this, from the placemaking that's, that's occurring here in, in Christ Church. Um, so, let's see. So, we think when you, when you focus on place, you do everything differently. And you're, after a crisis, you're forced to do that uh, a lot. And, and the focus on place is, is really about... In many ways, it's bringing back the informality to, to the shaping of cities. And it's the informality that first uh, became really pr present in, 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 you know, after the earthquake. Or in, at least what I saw as communicated around the world became really inspiring. And how do we support informality on a sustained basis? Um, but you have to formalize it a little bit in different ways. And so we're going to talk about that too. But when you focus on place, you do everything differently. You do governance differently. You do development, design. Uh, you, do the, you finance the, the growth of cities differently. Um, and it's, but it's, it's, it's about regrounding our participation, participation in shaping our world in place, but then you know, reinventing it again. So, you, so the lighter, quicker, cheaper stuff, the short-term 
stuff that you saw, the, the gap fillers and you know, the Festus stuff. This is so inspiring globally, but this is a seed for something larger. And you're at this moment now to figure out what that larger is. Make sure you build from and respect this, the culture and creativity that, that, that started that. But now how do, we, how do we not lose it? How do we actually take it further? How do we sustain it and grow it? Um, let's see. Oops. So we're seeing people come to this idea of place from many different causes and disciplines, uh, whether it's you know, in a neighborhood, citywide, or globally. We're, we're getting to work with leaders equally passionate at the community level or the global level that are passionate about sustainability or food, like the topic this weekend of FESTA, or local economies or health, uh, preservation. These are all causes that are so important and people are energized by. But we're seeing, they're not realizing their potential, they're not meeting their needs, uh, and their solutions are not yet being adopted fast enough. And we think that the focus on place enables the collaboration, the creativity, to more fundamentally address these goals, uh, but on a, deep, on a deeper level. Uh, and, and we can go into any of them, but we see the way to facilitate this change is, you know, and really what's been happening here is you're focusing on, on making places, getting on action, let's get things done, let's get things very visible. So it's not an abstract idea, it's not just community building or network building or uh, economic development, it, it is all those things, but the focus on place makes that grounded and, and, and it's about doing, place making is doing, it's not planning. Um, but while building the capacity of communities to do this more, so making it fun, having you, the most valuable thing about an event like this isn't anything I say, it's how you all start to work together in new ways and enjoy, enjoy that process. Um, but then making sure we're building systemic change too. We're not just perpetuating the same systems that haven't quite worked or don't have the potential to really address our needs or make us thrive. Uh, so how do, are we shifting the economy, the governance structures? And place has this common sense, comfortable way of ena enabling this. It's not about being against anything, but it's about being for something. But you do often need a crisis to create that change. And so you, you know, as, as the mayor said, you, you, a crisis can be helpful in, in, in some ways, and, 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 and you've, you've show, demonstrated that you know, in, the, in what you've built in the city. And it's so remarkable, the quality, the thoughtfulness of these buildings. Uh, and the urban design here is extraordinary. But place and placemaking is actually a way to leverage that and build that and take it another level further. Um, so Project for Public Spaces has gotten to work on, on places around the world, learning from communities in all different types of contexts uh, around the world. Again, we're working on the systemic change um, with, you know, with leaders of different movements. And then we're working on building a movement in and of itself, not to compete with these, but to bring them together, uh, you know, with, with leaders all around the world. And there's 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 some here, um, you know, Mike Mike Fisher and Frith Walker and Ryan Reynolds are, have been helping to network and lead the, the movement from this part of the world, but have also been coming to speak at all of our conferences globally and uh, and, and and connect this learning environment uh, on a global level. Oops. So you know, some of the global conferences we, we've had, and then this is of course part of Placemaking Week New Zealand, which has been amazing, spirited, and brought together all you know, property developers, elected officials last week in Auckland, uh, you know, really you know, advocates uh, and, and um, you know, activators from all different disciplines that are sort of building this movement from many different sectors. Um, but we're seeing this, we're going in, in a, we're having a conference with you in Habitat in China to launch a placemaking network there in December. And I, frankly, when some people from New Zealand are gonna come there and, and your story of place-led development is so crucial for, for building China. But for everybody, place shapes us and we shape place. And we have to build this reflexive relationship to be more powerful, more intentional, more conscious. We don't realize the extent to which it shapes how we feel about ourselves, each other, how it affects how we connect to each other. Um, and but we don't, how we shape it has, has been too much of it, just too passive, too consumptive, too narrow, too defined by different disciplines. Uh, if you plan for design and development, you get design and development. Even good design, great development, that's not enough. We, we can get more good design, more good development by leading with place, but this, uh, this is sort of reflective of an era that led with just development, of regeneration of cities with Guggenheim and Bilbao, with iconic architecture alone. It can create value, get attention, um, but this was a, a building, an object, not a place. Moments after I took this picture, I was there for 20 minutes. These two people mugged the couple 
a tourist couple of their camera. And I'm from New York and I hadn't seen a mugging. I told police they get people, and they said people get mugged right here all the time. This could be a great place with less money. This could have been a great place and a great building. You know, if you just had, if there was something to eat there, someone watching that space, selling some coffee, ice cream uh, in that space with the play area there, this was, could be a kid friendly place right on the waterfront. If looking at the map, you'd think this would be one of the most friendly places, but because of design, it didn't do that. And so, the, so Pope Francis says it's, it's not enough to seek the beauty of design. More precious still is the service we offer to another kind of beauty, people's quality of life, their adaption to the environment, encounter and mutual assistance. So, so you know, we were surprised that Pope Francis is also a, a placemaker. His encyclical had a lot of these types of quotes. Um, and Jane Jacobs, who we consider a saint in the church of placemaking, <laughs> uh, to, to approach the city as if it were an architectural problem is to make the mistake of substituting art for life. So uh, life is, we have to build from life, not just for life. And, um, and then the other big you know, mistake cities are making, of course, is planning for cars and traffic. We get more cars and traffic. We get this behavior, this is in, in Sydney. Uh, you don't go downtown again if you have an experience crossing a street like this. this the fear uh, uh, that this instills in people, you know, is, is, it affects their memory. Um, but it's not about being against the car and traffic, it's about being for people and places. Reinventing our transportation system around destinations to go to, not through, uh, with many purposes to be there. And of course, informality, human comfort, uh, connection is at the core of that. And that's actually part of transportation planning. It's achieving more goals for, for each trip, uh, in a sense. So um, we led a campaign in New York City uh, in sort of the mid-2000s to, to transform our street space into, into better public spaces, into destinations, the, the most unsafe places. And we looked at city places all over the city, but Broadway offered a lot of these, these potential destinations. Uh, we worked with communities to, to envision what they could be. We also created, we had a lot of events like this where we'd gather and learn from each other. And we realized, you know, a lot of the expertise and advocacy is there, it just has to be connected. And, you know, the most uh, visible changes, of course, were, were made, you know, up and down Broadway. We worked with the Times Square Alliance, it's the, the business improvement districts and the community-based organizations to transform these places first on a temporary basis. Um, and the city, we, we got a, our goal was to get a new transportation commissioner and she came in and, and implemented all of these projects from the community. Um, but it was really, it was the advocates that made this happen throughout the city and then the local advocates were actually the most important around each community, each place. Um, and uh, you know, the transformation was powerful and centered around the world. But the story with all these projects in New York, and I'll keep saying, is that it's, it's the process and it's the man local management, the governance models that are key. Just copying the form of these projects it hasn't really worked. And in fact, uh, you know, the temporary plaza in Times Square became permanent. Uh, the, the businesses didn't like the idea at first, and, but the testing of it with the experimental approach worked. Uh, it built momentum for something that wouldn't have been possible otherwise. Uh, and now, you know, it's a much more high quality urban design project, but, you know, after this was built, and it's, it's, it's wonderful, um, you know, and it, it's good for events, and, and uh, but the most threatening, highly controversial uh, political issue in New York for, for a period of time was these buskers, this, um, and, and, and Elmo. This was the most threatening character in New York. So Times Square used to be defined by, by you know, sleaze and, and crime and perhaps, and, and, now, and then it got defined by cars and traffic. It was dominated by cars and traffic and, and, then, and then of course Elmo. And they couldn't regulate it. <laughs> so uh, the, the, the issue was that they just designed it but didn't develop the management and programming of the space, didn't give enough regulatory power to the Times Square Alliance to, to manage the space. Uh, and so you don't just design something without a, pro a plan for programming, activating it, managing it, governing it, and so forth. So New York has really been transformed by these public destinations, these, but it's the processes and, and the management organizations that we have to learn from. But I think a lot of cities have, have most effectively transformed themselves around these destinations. So our, our, our sort of theory of change, if you want to um, make a big impact pretty quickly, is focus on, de on public destinations. 
but each public destination, we say, needs at least 10 places. You know, the sort of the, the size of a place is really the, the distance at which you make eye contact, you connect with people, um, you can see a smile, and so forth. Um, and that's the scale at which a city fails and succeeds. Yeah, but people slow down in these places when there's uh, multiple reasons to be in them. Uh, not, it's not, you know, design matters, but it's actually the, the excuses to stop and spend time, the excuses to feel justified there, and for a whole range of different types of people to feel, you know, different ages to feel comfortable in a space. So those are the places where retail's most viable, where memories happen, where people return because they think it's gonna keep changing. It's dynamic, it has that dynamic energy. Um, so Bryant Park, we did it, was one of our early projects uh, in the late 70s and Rockefeller Center. These were projects that were transformed not by being afraid of the negative activity there, and not just by design, but by management and programming and uh, allowing use to, to come forward. Um, so this Power of 10 idea is also an exercise for engaging people citywide in a conversation around their places and what ideas they have to, to improve them. And we've done this exercise in many places. I did this in Melbourne on one of my first trips here. I've been lucky to get to come to New Zealand and Australia sort of a couple times a year for the last 11 or 12 years. And, um, and you know, I've gained huge respect. The, the quality of, of, uh, you know, of, of, of council staff is, is really wonderful here. The government's doing a really good job, it's very progressive. Uh, you know, and, and this exercise revealed, though, that there's a lot of room for broader collaboration amongst different departments, and then, of course, with community. Uh, which is always hard. So we find that every part of the world is leading the placemaking movement from one sector, and that's great. There's a lot of creativity from, from councils, um, but the challenge is now how do you get creativity from communities and business sector and philanthropy and draw out that volunteerism and because the best places have a collaboration from all sectors. And we, so every part of the world, one of those sectors sort of is leading in placemaking, but the challenge is how do you get the others involved. So Melbourne, though, the, the places that people loved, these sort of green dots, were places that... Uh, that, that weren't is created as much through sort of the, the council or the government. Uh, you know, they, were, they were allowed to happen. They were supported in various ways, but they were surprised. There was, you know, even though there's really good urban design throughout, good quality development, there weren't that many places that people loved. They were surprised by that. And uh, the, the yellow dots were sort of these opportunity places where if you added a few more reasons to them, they, they could become great. So we see this sort of evolution in development from what we call project-driven to place-led. And they're all important qualities to, to have in your city. And obviously there's, you know, especially after a crisis, there's real reasons to develop, to deliver project-led, project-driven approaches, you know, to build the infrastructure re, uh, and so forth. But we think at least the goal has to be to get to place-led, to build the capacity of communities to, to regenerate, thrive, um, you know, as much on their own as possible. And you know, discipline-led is still just hiring the best experts to come in with better solutions. Place sensitive is you know, listening to communities and the cultural context and working across disciplines, uh, but it's still just taking the information and then sort of spitting it back at communities. Place led is let's make place the shared goal, the shared value of the public realm, the primary goal, and also building the capacity of communities, uh, you know, a primary uh, objective as well. Um, so you can't always get there, but it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an intention of getting in that direction. Uh, and the private sector is moving in this direction too. It's really exciting. We're seeing many of them are seeing public spaces as the new anchor tenant, as leading with place publicly defined places uh, with real public goals as an anchor to driving the market, and and then in, attracting people and investment on the terms of a local community and adding to that and building a trusting relationship, a creative relationship in the process. This is um, uh, Darling Quarter in, in Sydney. So what is placemaking? So placemaking. Is, it's a word we kind of made up. A bunch of people have been throwing it around about 20 odd years ago, and, uh, it's, and we're still learning really what it is and sort of unpacking it, and the process of debating what it means is helpful. And of course, you know, who does placemaking, who is it for, and are places already made, or do we preserve them? We do think a great way to preserve places and, and celebrate what, they, you know, what the essence of them is to continually have the conversation of recreating them too. So it's, proactive placemaking is important. Uh, it's actually one of the best ways to preserve and keep uh, places and support preservation. Uh, so some definitions, is, one is that it's a collaborative process by which we can shape our public realm in order to maximize shared value. Uh, we've, we came up with some others in, in Auckland uh, this week that are really good. 
uh, that you know, we can share with you. But it's also strengthening the connection between people and the places they share. There was an MIT study that showed that uh, the biggest benefit of placemaking isn't the improved place, but the improved social capital, the human relationships and collaboration that emerges through the process of placemaking. Um, and of course, we're trying to make this placemaking a global movement. We've been working with UN Habitat for, for, for many years now to make public spaces and placemaking a global cause and to include it into the new urban agenda. Um, and it was mentioned 10 times in this, this uh, international document. Every 20 years, they create a new urban agenda to define the priorities for urbanization globally. Uh, and now we're going further through this conference in China, and, and we did one in Nairobi, uh, where, where how place and placemaking can, can facilitate you know, many different solutions and, and, and actors together to, to implement the new urban agenda. To, to, we, haven't, we need new processes and structures to really get this to happen, to create a global movement to shape spaces into places. Uh, as one of our board members said here. And one of the thoughts at this, city, at this conference was that cities are not built forms, they are social forms. We, we must design from social life, not just for it. And again, I think that's what you know, a gap filler has sort of done, is it's from social life and supported it. Um, it's, it's a platform, you know, the, the, it was so cool to actually see the dance with Matt and, you know, and, and you know, after seeing hundreds of pictures of it all around the world, and it's, it's, just, it's, it's about a platform for social life that keeps growing it. Saskia Sassen was at these conferences, says that the city has long been complex but incomplete and in that mix of complexity and incompleteness lies the possibility of those without power to make a history, to make a culture, to make an economy. And you know, the incompleteness of Christ Church offers a unique opportunity to, you know, to create new structures that are obviously more equitable and more inclusive, um, you know, to create leadership, more leadership from the people that lived here a long time, uh, but also attract people to, to, to help create a culture and economy, new identity, new, new jobs, new, new ideas. And so these ideas have actually been part of this new urban agenda as well, where Saskia Sassen and Richard Sennett, Ricky Burdett have said that what's really needed for you know, the new paradigm in city building is actually uh, more, more informality in our cities. We've sort of formalized our cities in the process of shaping cities. Uh, more flexibility of public spaces, more and uh, more multiple uses, more, Jane Jacobs calls them intricate minglings, the layering of, of leading with that, and then again, shaping development around that. So the place-led process, the, the place-making process, we think starts with places, starts with an exercise like the power of 10, your assets and opportunities. Uh, we think you, you evaluate a place, you engage people in, in the pe people know places so well, it's asking the right questions, drawing out of them their expertise, their creativity, but more about the uses. We don't ask people to design the space. It's what do you want to do there? What do you do there? Uh, and then we start doing short-term experiments. We think that's the best projects and more and more we're realizing that the best public spaces actually are a continual series of experiments and, and, and evolution of the sort of, again, the, of temporary public spaces. It, they can continually be evolving in a temporary way. Those are the most dynamic ones. And you, you've learned and, and shared so much of the best temporary types of, of public space activation creation, the models that have emerged here. But the best part of that is that it builds ongoing capacity and energy and, and it doesn't just die. It's not just a project that you built, check that off and we're done. It's every place is an ongoing, you're building the community, the governance. It takes a place to create a community and a community to create a place. This is an iterative process. So the city we've worked the most in is Detroit, and it has some similarities that you'll, you know, you can, you'll, you'll see as, uh, on many levels, it, you know, it, 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 it failed in, 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 in some regards, its economy, it had a lot of the, you know, it was one of the more conservative sort of older, um, you know, older cities, that, you know, it was defined by sort of old corporate models and in the automobile industry, you know, there was, of course, threatened, um, and we've worked there for the last 20 years on a lot of key public spaces, but this is what it was like 100 years ago. It was one of the most vibrant cities in, in North America, and this had food trucks even. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it was trendy way back then. So, uh, and so we, we were brought in to sort of create a vision to create a destination downtown to, to, to take that intersection you know, that was like this, the same Soldiers and Sailors Monument, you can see, it's right there. And, you know, the, all the planners and designers and corporations, you know, destroyed the center of the city. And we, this was built pretty quickly, it cost $20 million to build, it attracted billions of dollars of investment in the blocks right around it. 
you know, what it looked like you know, the first summer and the first winter. And then as, as it attracted new investment, new people coming to this, uh, one, of the, the proper, one of the developers or the, 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 the corporate titans basically that, it, that attracted downtown wanted to take, buy up a bunch of buildings, but really invest in the public spaces to drive the value and potential of it. So we did this lighter, quicker, cheaper plan of short-term activations throughout the, the downtown. And um, that's what it was like before it. And we did this photo simulation and they've actually implemented it, it is within a few months. And we put a beach right at the center of Detroit during the, the same week that Detroit declared bankruptcy. Uh, <laughs> And because the government facilitated this, but there was really, it was, there was no real, it was very resourcefully done. And you know, here's what it's like pretty much on a regular basis now. And in the winter, um, the beach in the center of the space. And this place has become this very tactile, comfortable human space where many people feel comfortable and welcome and, and mix. And it's this layering of different purposes to the space that en enable the mixing. You know, very simple, low cost, changes the markets, incubating small businesses, making retail viable, um, and, and so forth. So we see this place light as sort of a third way. People are afraid of chaos, and you know, Detroit was sort of this chaotic place, perhaps, and you know, th you know, they thought it needed to be ordered and controlled. There's often these tensions in government and with communities. We see place light as sort of a way to create a facilitative future, to be more resourceful, more integrative, and um, and proactive and action oriented, uh, you know, and um, and this also emerged, you know, in Perth. We've we've gotten to work in a lot of the, the major Australian cities and building place making campaigns, but also doing sort of projects that really uh, demonstrated, you know, a place led approach. And the cultural center there, I'm showing because it has some things in common with what's emerging right here in an exciting way, where you're leading with again instead of an activation, um, but how that can anchor and define a cultural center is more than just a place. A, you know, a series of buildings, but a whole destiny, a district that creates culture in many different skills, informal, informal, and uh, this is, their goal was to become a, all the different institutions hadn't really talked to each other in this district. Um, and in effect, you know, there was no reason for them to be all right next to each other. But as they started to see themselves as a, a collective destination, uh, not just of s isolated places, but of, of many shared places, they realized they had great placemaking skills, of course, in the arts community and, and resources and, and ideas. And if they just started to do these things, we did a very detailed activation plan of here's what you do here and there. They didn't follow it. It was fine. And they, they did it much better. Each, they all realized that they're placemakers. And uh, this was the sort of temporary type of stuff that they, they implemented. Um, so before and afters and, and you know. It's all, this is all very temporary, sort of low-cost changes. That it keeps evolving and changing, and it, you know their goal was to become one of the most visited destinations in, in Western Australia. And I think they've achieved that. The markets and the, the winter and the light festivals and the digital placemaking elements and so forth. So some key pl placemaking principles, just to sort of close with: uh, the community is the expert. You have to treat them as such, respect them as such, as experts in their places, but also inspire them, inform them. Draw them out. The role of the, the, the government, the experts, professions, isn't to have the, all the answers. It's to facilitate. It's, it's, it's a different, we're not trained to do that. It's to inspire and challenge. And it's reinventing this relationship where communities have to help solve problems. They can't just consume and, and complain. They, they, they have to be a partner in solving problems because they're often the best at doing it and coming up with solutions. You can't do it alone. Triangulating, layering of many purposes in a space is where the magic comes from. It's at this human scale. That, that happens. And then place making is about doing, it's about lighter, quicker, cheaper, to inform more permanent design, but it, it needs, we need continually evolving dynamic spaces. And, and you've learned so much about that, and now's the time to build on that, not to just leave that be. So, but lastly, place is a means to reinvent governance. Uh, and we've learned this a lot working with, in Adelaide, your sister city. It's the city I've worked most in in, in this part of the world. Um, where they realized that let's, let's create a, a collective place capital index. Let's look at, let's connect all the different departments for shared value, you know, looking at how they can all create shared value, uh, moving beyond their different silos, and how that can then reinvent their relationship to communities. They launched this great program that Mike Fisher led here. Um, 
called Splash Adelaide that first you know, inspired the community with some great activations, then asked for sort of matching from the community uh, to, to lead them. So the whole process wasn't to just do placemaking for communities, it was to do it with them and find, the most important thing was to find the people that could help lead it, build their capacity to further lead it, to sustain this, and eventually to sort of devolve and some of the government to, to, uh, to these precincts and districts that are more responsive to place and communities can get more diversity of revenue streams and uh, keep evaluating their places, keep growing them, and then in, in making bureaucracy less threatening so that people in the place then, these place managers, place facilitators can navigate the different departments and skills that are necessary to keep growing these places. So placemaking localizes, it makes places special, it draws out the soul of them, it's a magnet for talent, but most importantly, it draws out the talent that's there and attracts new talent to come and add to the culture and identity of a place and to, to, uh, not, you know, to not impose on it. This sort of innovation theme, we're looking at how do you connect innovation economy with play, the place economy to make sure the innovation economy is actually inclusive and grow connected to place and the benefits of, of innovation are shared and, and attached to place. Um, it's about social capital and place capital. And it's economic development. It's about sustaining your, your local economy. Uh, but it's through places that we create culture and identity and, and, and economic value. Um, and you know, the new ideas, the, the, the sort of the, the alchemy of place, uh, the, the, the social densities that, that place can enable, are, we think are what anchor the types of innovations that are going to solve bigger problems, that are going to allow New Zealand to be a leader on many different issues, economically, culturally, politically. Um, and so forth. So this is you know, the first placemaking week in New Zealand and sort of coming, you know, wrapping up and ending with festas, this amazing celebration. Uh, and we see your leadership is key to this global conversation, this global conversation um, you know, e everywhere. Uh, and we're looking forward to doing these placemaking weeks again. We want, it's all about, there's lots of things that you can all offer in your community, citywide, globally. Uh, and you know, we encourage you to, to connect with you know, some of the placemaking leadership council here. You know, with, with Frith, who will be on the panel, with um, and you know, and Ryan and, and, and Mike Fisher, and uh, and, and, and st you know, stay connected to, to us as well. Um, but it's you know, you're all leaders. We all have a lot of responsibility to make this work, to learn, to make mistakes, to make it fun, to challenge each other, to challenge each other to do better. Uh, so it's, it's an ongoing conversation and you all are, are some of the world leaders in it. So no pressure, but we, uh, we need you to help figure it out. So thank you very much. I'm gonna turn it over to, to Ryan here, who uh, is, is one of, um, is it? okay, there you go. There you go. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Right, all right. Kia ora um, It is my illustrious uh, duty here to introduce our panelists and try to rip into a bit of a conversation up here in response to Ethan's talk uh, and then open it up to the rest of you, uh, hopefully with plenty of time here. So first, uh, immediately on my right, is Debbie Tikau. She is the General Manager of Matapopuri Charitable Trust, a landscape architect with 20 years experience in ecological, commercial and public realm design and delivery. Uh, currently a panelist on our urban design panel here in Christchurch uh, and brings a very holistic approach to her work. So she uh, looks after the day-to-day -day operations of Mata Popuri and uh, they're working to demonstrate how indigenous values and traditional knowledge can be expressed within the built environment. Um, I, th I think I've got it right. So Mata Popuri was set up by Naitahu after the earthquakes to be the statutory partner on the anchor projects. Uh, we were set up to um, we were set up to support that process. Our right. job was actually to embed that cultural identity. So the statutory partner was uh, Tūrunanga or Naitahu. Right. And will it now extend beyond that? Yes, it will. Great. Yes. Glad to hear it. Um, I believe next we have Patrick Fontaine. Uh, he's the director of Studio D4, a property consulting and development management company. Uh, more than 20 years experience of property development in the New Zealand market. You said predominantly in Auckland, but you've got a fair few things on here, <laughs> Patrick. Um, so Patrick was one of the youngest recipients of a fellowship from the New Zealand Property Institute. Uh, he actually initiated the setting up of the Auckland City Council Urban Design Panel, served on the panel for close to a decade. Um, and now in Christchurch, you've really got a lot of the innovation precinct 
projects. Vodafone building, Kathmandu, uh, the hospitality venues through mm -hmm. kind of that whole block, Litchfield to them, and is it Ash Street? Ash Street, mm -hmm. Madras yeah. Street. Yep. Yeah. 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 So we've been doing quite a lot of work in that area, plus uh, other parts of Christchurch as well. Cool. Look forward to hearing more about it, and thank you for being here. Frith Walker, all the way down from Auckland this afternoon. Uh, Frith is the manager of placemaking at Panuku Development Auckland. Uh, has a theatre background. Yeah. <laughs> um, Frith joined Waterfront Auckland in 2011 uh, as placemaker for the Wynyard Quarter with a specific focus on the programming and place management of the new public spaces uh, on the Auckland waterfront and is now the manager of placemaking for Panuku. And my understanding, more or less, uh, Waterfront Auckland kind of merged with the citywide Auckland property holdings, and so you're kind of doing the same sort of placemaking thing, but for all of the city developments around Auckland? Yeah, that's the, uh, Auckland, Auckland is growing at a pace, so they created a sort of an arranged marriage of, of Waterfront Auckland and Auckland Council Property Limited to try and bring good redevelopment for uh, utilising council's land holdings across the region. So placemaking for the waterfront is very different for placemaking for the rest of Auckland, but yeah. Slightly bigger remit. Hmm. Same amount of man hours. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Thank you. Um, and I'm Ryan Reynolds. I'm one of the founders of the Gap Tiller Trust. We started up after the earthquakes here doing, uh, I guess, community projects that retrospectively s might have something in common with placemaking. Uh, I, I think you know we've very much learned along the way and uh, have now been trying a bit harder to integrate those sort of principles and ways of thinking into the longer term development. Since about 2013, uh, we've been doing commercial work uh, around New Zealand, around the world, and a few commercial contracts in, in Christchurch as well. Um, uh, and actually picking up on your, uh, your point here, I, I, I think, but in general, Christchurch, I feel like is different to a lot of the examples that you showed in your talk in that we, I mean, our central city was gutted. Mm. And now we've got a master plan being implemented, lots of developments, civic squares being built, and a lot of people working in a way on placemaking before the people actually live there or before the businesses are, are back. So, and, and maybe that is a bit like the Wynyard Quarter, waterfront area in, in, in Auckland. So how, question to everyone really, but how, how does placemaking need to be different or is it even right to still call it placemaking if you're doing it before the the people are there rather than the with the people as you're talking about? I'm, I'm, um, firstly, I've had the great privilege of, of being around Ethan for, the, for about a week. Um, and I'm, I'm walking out of this time really feeling good about the fact that we shouldn't try and define this thing or lock it down and go, it is that. Uh, my first boss, um, I'm going to acknowledge Neil McEnroy, who's just joined us, who's also part of this whole story. <laughs> and I'm probably going to quote him a lot. Um, my first boss gave me one instruction, which was let the place speak for itself. So I think if we consider ourselves placemakers, our first job is to go and be with that place and work out what is the right response. So for the waterfront, it was about acknowledging the marine industry and uh, the yachties and the boaties and the slightly shifty businesses that sort of take place on waterfronts and um, trying to create massive public space that was going to hold major events and um, so Graham Henry living in apartment. So that, that's that mix. And then you go to somewhere like Northcote, same job, go be with the place be with it, learn from it, learn from the people, and then work out what the right response is. So I think it's horses for courses, or didn't mean for a gambling analogy there, sorry about <laughs> yeah, I think uh, you know, the opportunity that we've got in Christchurch here, we do work in Auckland and in Christchurch, and the, the thing that really attracts me to keep coming back here is uh, we're building this whole new city. Right? And that's such, a, such an exciting opportunity. You don't get that chance very often. And so, you know, the role that property people have in all of that is to work really closely with the placemaking team, within the urban design team. And I think it, it beholds on all the property people to think about urban design aspects, to try and link the um, public realm with the private realm, their own buildings. And if you can do that really well, then you create these great places that people want to come to. And you see from some of the pictures that Ethan has shown, um, it's the great places that people that want to come to that make really good property investments. Right? And, and that's what we try and really focus on and, and trying to make that public realm work. If we can get the mix, say if you look at the Ducks Courtyard, right? you know, we've looked really carefully how do we integrate that with the public spaces. And if we can get the seam, seamless transaction working between the two, then that's what we've got. We've also... Uh, We've got a 
interesting situation where we have got so much new public realm that is appearing a lot. And, a lot. A lot. and it's how do you uh, get people to connect? So you talk a lot about, um, you know, you want people to connect to place. And so when you've got new place, and often that place is devoid of anything really substantial around it, or sometimes there may be a little bit of built form around it, but that built form is emerging. So that public space is important because it's there to um, encourage that investment and set the scene. But at the same time, we also need people to start to populate, to start to connect. And so that's the challenge that we're faced with in the city. I guess that's why I, I question whether some of the projects I've been involved in would count as placemaking, because you say, I mean, I, I think I got it designed from social life, not for it, which resonates with me. But at the same time, I feel like quite a, quite a few projects we've been doing to like desperately try to get some cultural life in a place rather than drawing from what's already there. Yeah, I, I mean, we, th we think it's an iterative process no matter what. You're always starting, mm. you have to start with something to get something and you keep building it up. And, and so leading with some activation, we think is actually the best engagement. But if you, can, if you have to treat it like that, this is, mm. it's an open conversation where you're doing something. And I think that's what, these were platforms for activity to come into, for people to add new purpose and meaning to these spaces. Um, and that's also, I think, you know, what, what's happened in, in you know, with, with the Winyard Quarter and this, the seeding of, the, of the, the reinvention of Auckland's identity at the water's edge with people coming together there uh, and then how that drives the, the identity and, and um, design and the new development that comes in to add to that place. So, it's, you know, it's just building up. Um, between us, so you work for a council-owned company that owns an awful lot of property. Mm -hmm. Uh, and is generally reasonably resourced. Mm -hmm. uh, you're a property developer, primarily. I own nothing, or our organization <laughs> owns next to nothing. Um, and you, I mean, the main form Mata Popri works in is a, a sort of cultural advisory, so That's you don't great. necessarily have yeah. the power or resources to implement the designs or the things that you want integrated. You're we work with partners, and we uh, so we achieve those outcomes, but um, in collaboration with part our yeah. partners, our project partners. So can I ask a question? Uh, I mean, in the, who should ideally be leading and initiating placemaking projects, or, or the nicer way, uh, what are the different sort of pros and cons of it being led by council or a CCO, private developers, third sector? I think, I think we all have a role to play, yeah. and the big thing is that we've got to stand up, take the responsibility. There's a number of different players, and, and I think the, the bit, uh, uh, what we need to do is, is reflect on uh, what every partner has throughout the process, and then do their best to create really memorable places. And if we all work together, and as you say, it's an evolving process, mm -hmm. and, and we need to learn. Sometimes we don't get it right, and we need to make some changes as we go along. Mm -hmm. um, but we've got to keep working hard, and create places for people, because if the people want to come, then that's going to create further value to the whole area. Just for, for me, and I think it's okay to say my team, we, we keep pulling out the term servant leadership. So we, we think it, it works kind of nicely when leadership is coming from lots of different places and there's kind of, there's a, there's a ball being passed around. I'm going for a lot of sporting analogies this evening, I'm really sorry, it's not like me. <laughs> um, but to, to provide, if, if sometimes you've got to go and, like the Winyard Court is a good example, there, was, there wasn't extensive talking to everybody in Auckland about how they you know, wanted to see their waterfront, that wouldn't have resulted in that outcome. That was a, a leadership move and now we're slipping into more and more dialogue. So I think it's that moment of, of assessing who is the right person to lead and then supporting that leadership and being clever and humble enough to step out when it's not your turn. There's a couple of things, you know, for Christchurch, if we reflect back on Auckland, people talk about the Wynyard Quarter and they talk about Hobsonville. Uh, you know, I've seen those projects right from the very start. Uh, and it's interesting, you reflect back on Wynyard Quarter, probably for the first six or seven years, that place was, uh, was not thriving, right? Um, nope, that's wrong. Uh, <laughs> and, 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 you know, it's taken a long time, but you, you, the team has stuck with it and you've done really well. You've created the public spaces. And now that, that whole area is, is moving. And you know, we've got the framework in place. Uh, we've really been at it for seven years you know, within Christchurch. It's really a 15 to 20 year plan to get the city built. But everything that we do, we've just got to move as best we can to create people places. Mm -hmm. Now the big challenge for Christchurch, which, which it somewhat surprises me, but then it doesn't, about half the people in the city 
haven't been in the CBD since the earthquakes. Yeah. You know, and that's just this massive opportunity. And we have the opportunity to get them to come once, and, and then if they come once, they've got to come again. And, that, and that's just this, I, I, mm -hmm. I find that hard to believe, when, but that's, that's the, the, the opportunity we have. Can I just go can for I a first... point, of, point of correction? Um, wrong, sir. Uh, everybody said when the World Cup left, the Winyard Quarter would fail, and that's not what happened. So yeah. we've, we've built, I'm very glad that my KPIs were not based on Silo Park's attendances in the first couple of rounds, because it was not that great. But um, this sort of, as Ethan says, that, that sort of slow, iterative, attracting people on an attachment basis and an ongoing visitation basis has worked. Um, but it's much more, th or it has become much more than just about that place. Absolutely. I mean, when I first uh, was working in Auckland in 2013, was it, yep, Lido, yep, I think? Yep. And everyone was pointing to the things happening in Silo Park, Wynyard Quarter, the yeah. pop-up activations there as the kind of justification or the calling card to set up the new thing that in the urban design team to set up the pop project through council. I don't know if that was art or events team and so on. So it was kind of the, um, I don't know, the foot in the door that made it possible for lots of others all around the city. And now Auckland's got... Um, but the, the thing Ethan reminds me of a lot is that it, it led with the public space. The first thing to go in was the public space, was the food, get the humans being there and liking it, and then the development will, will you know, people, people will want to come in. So we've got wonderful partners now in there. But that's the... That's put the humans in, and then the people with their wallets will come. Was sort of the theory, right? I think the, the, the I think the comment I was making was uh, you look at that that whole I'm just quarter, tonight, sorry. That's all right. <laughs> <laughs> it's because you're too close to this. Um, you know, if you look at the wide area, the stuff right on the waterfront was going okay, but then you look at it two to three to four blocks back, like that's challenging, and now that area is really thriving through the the, the public spaces that have been bought in. You know, and and uh, I I see uh, Christchurch is really on the edge of of uh, gaining this critical mass. And we've just got to keep, keep going, creating lots of events. I think that's one of the major things, to keep people drawing into the city. And we've got to really reflect on how hard it is for hospitality at the moment in the city, because those people have, have placed um, uh, uh, their, their money and, and into the opportunity, and, and it will be good, but we've just got to work as hard as we can to create the public spaces um, can, and Can we talk through. a bit about the governance thing that you brought up. So it's one thing to create the public spaces, but how, how do they evolve? How do they actually get used? Who's responsible for looking after them when they don't? Because we've got a lot of public spaces created by the Crown Agency and now in various stages of being vested, I think vested ownership in council and other things. So you've got on the one hand like the formal ownership structures. And often, I mean, we're experiencing in the East Frame in Rawara Park, someone gets in touch to use a space for an event and actually no one's quite clear who owns the land or who's able to say yes at a, at a given moment. So it's kind of the opposite of being really facilitative, it, temporarily, I hope. But um, yeah, and, and alongside those formal ownership structures, you have the informal of who's actually generating the activity or, or enabling it and so on. Which is sure. more important or? Yeah, yeah. How do those relate? So, yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, governance, it's not a sexy, fun word, but it is where we're seeing a lot of the innovation in this. And in a way, to also to answer your, your previous question is who in initiates placemaking, is it whoever's leading it? We want placemaking leadership can start with anywhere, with anyone. And it needs to sort of equally start with different sectors. We need to understand how property developers can do it. And there's, you know, these are it's great, the, the, the role in this innovation quarter that the property sector is doing and with the, the, the government, with the, the third sector, the, the not-for-profit sector, we all have to feel like we can lead it and initiate it, but we have to keep in mind that ultimately, the, to really sustain it and have a, the bigger impact, it's gonna be a collaboration. We have to figure out how, if, you know, if any one of us lead it, how do we get the other, mm. of this great panel that, that I think, that just put together, thank mm. you, um, that uh, it, we all, ha it, it needs to be more multi-sector, more collaborative, and, you know, so we, we help set up a lot of the first, <coughs> sort of public space management models in the US, like the first business improvement districts and main streets. And each of them are having strengths and weaknesses and we need to keep, keep evolving them to see who's not leading in them, who's not, who's not part of it. Um, but publicness, place capital, shared value, informality needs to anchor it as, as outcomes, you know, the, 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 it, as, as measurable. Uh, uh, and that, again, we think drives the value and the collaboration, uh, the private value and all kinds of measured value. Um, 
through that process. And, so, and, and I think you know that's each of each of these projects are, are and each of these, these people are are ultimately leading with that, that type of thing. Maybe if I can Maybe, give you an example. Hang, hang, hang on a sec. Sorry. I, is this really kind of urban focused, development focused notion of of governance? That, I mean, does that gel with your what the term means to you? <laughs> what what I've what what I've noticed, uh, we we. Um, we realised that a lot of the events that were happening around town didn't have that cultural content. So what um, what we've started to actively uh, sort of participate in are those conversations. How do we uh, we very much involved with embedding cultural identity within the city, which in itself um, creates place and creates connection to place. But we also want to ensure that we include cultural practice. And uh, recently, um, in fact, it was just yesterday, we opened up um, Kakatea Common, and we we instigated bringing so in a this busload. This is one of the new the, civic spaces for, in the south and one frame. of the new civic spaces from the south frame. And we brought in a busload of kids from Tuahiwi School, and they came in and they performed kapahaka for everybody, and it was fantastic. So, um, and we're also very much part of the conversations around ensuring that, you know, the places that we create, if we're putting stories into the city, that we need to share those and we need to actually, um, uh, you know, bring the whānau from outside in. And they're wanting to come in now because they're seeing themselves in the city. And that's fantastic. And also with the opening of Tūranga, we had a busload of kaumātua who, who came in. Again, you know, these, they, they, they don't come into the city. They never come into the city. And here they are, they're wanting to participate, they're wanting to be part of this and uh, bring their, I suppose, their identity in. So it's not just about, from a cultural perspective, it's not just about, I suppose, the built outcomes that we leave behind, but also about those, um, you know, about the whānau and the people coming into the city and feeling that they belong and, again, you know, uh, and, and increasing that sense of belonging and, uh, and, and increasing that sense of identity. When you say they come now because they see themselves in yes. the city, I mean, I know uh, Naitahu identity is much more visible now in places where it was previously invisible. We were just in Victoria Square yep. earlier. Is, do you mean just that, or is it kind of broader than just visual markers? Um, okay, so I think what, what, I suppose what we try to do, and it's a little bit of a different uh, angle from what you were discussing in terms of placemaking activities, but um, what we try to do, what we're trying to do through storytelling within the city is actually um, create reasons for people to, uh, I suppose it brings, it creates reasons for people to come in, but also Yes, it's very much about identity, but it's also about education. It's also about imparting those, that knowledge. All the stories that we tell are full of layers and layers of information. <coughs> and so it, and it, it's about, um, you know, with the work that we're creating, a series of narratives are all interconnected. So they themselves become an event for people to come in and experience. So uh, it's more than just a built outcome. It's... Mm -hmm. Um, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a classroom, it's a place of, of learning, a place of knowledge, and a place to engage. Yeah. In a very different way, I feel like a lot of our work is about creating more, creating more opportunities that a wider range of people can see themselves in the city, yes. who can understand that they might have a role to play, or that it could be a place for them too. Well, I think, I think. What, we, what we're trying to do is, is, is share those stories with katoa with everybody. Mm -hmm. They're not, and everybody, we want everybody to feel that they belong and connect, you know, and our kids are nowadays, you know, it's... It's, it's interesting, the, uh, we did a bit of a walk around the city with, with Ethan this afternoon, and some of the things I learned from Debbie this afternoon, and I've, I've walked through these areas like 10 times, and you shared some of the cultural issues behind there, you know, and I think there's this really big opportunity for you to create a walking tour and, and promote that a mm -hmm. lot better. And you know, and that really reflects on um, one of the, the. I say this is an Aucklander now. Right? One of the Christchurch things is you know you'd like to lay below the radar and keep things nice and quiet and just quietly beaver away. You know, there's some really good things happening. Uh, you need to just sort of stand up above the parapet and and be bold about those really good things that you're doing. Um, and and I think that's what we all need to do. Uh, these these really good opportunities in these really great places that we are creating um, is. Uh, um, communicate those a lot better with, with your own people within Christchurch and within the wider community. 
Mm. Um, Ethan, you've brought up the word experimental a few times, and I think in a couple different uh, um, meanings or layers of meaning. One, just the idea of trying something out, the lighter, quicker, cheaper, it doesn't have to be perfect the first time, but also um, thinking about some of the bigger picture issues, you kind of gestured around climate change and some things like that, that we don't have the solutions yet, and we better experiment to, to find them. Um, maybe I'm trying too hard to draw some things together, but it occurs to me that to Pakeha in New Zealand, a lot of the Mana Whenua principles are really experimental and radical, things that are about adaptability rather than permanence, communality rather than individual private mm. ownership about me, 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 dare I say even spiritual. Mm. That's pretty experimental to us. <laughs> so, so maybe there's a, a, you know, a space of overlap in that, in that respect. Well, absolutely. I mean, the guiding principle that we work to is Katafai Kita Iwi, and that's, um, you know, be kind to, it's about everybody create an environment for everybody. It's um, look after your people. And, um, and it's based on the principle of manakitanga. So it's about being inclusive. Yeah. yeah. Do you think, are we ready to open the gate and allow some questions from the outsiders? Oh, it's a really quickly, you about to make a <laughs> Yeah, I was going to say something deeply inspiring. <laughs> um, no, um, it's the, the, that's the journey we've been on in Auckland, is, is English is a very lumpy language to try and explain placemaking. And, um, Te Rawa Māori does a much better job, and also when did we forget how to build with our environments? When did we forget how to build places that are good for community? When did we stop working like that? So this opportunity we have in this country to turn our mind to the people that still remember how to be a part of the land is pretty valuable, and we should be using it. Mm. Thanks. All right, um, can we open up to questions, and where did the microphone runners go? Fabulous, all right. Um, can, can I just say, we're, we're due to wrap up this event at 7.30. All of the panelists can be here till 8. So if you have an individual question for one person, please hold that till the end and you can come up and talk to us as, uh, as we're packing down. And, and let's try to continue the conversation as it were. Dai. Kia ora. It's great to uh, hear from you all. First mention, let the place speak for itself. And it's wonderful that Natura really are speaking. It's wonderful, Debbie. And I wonder, you know, the, the earthquakes reminded us that the springs wish to speak. <laughs> and I think of it as a city of a thousand springs. Well, it's got many more thousands of springs than that. But it's a city of a thousand springs, water springs. Do you think we could let the springs speak more. You each think we could? You're looking at me. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, um, we're forever trying to protect the springs and also to ensure that, um, you know, where, where there are known springs that, um, you know, you know, obviously I also work in the environmental space for Runanga, so, you know, it's, 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 you know, it's an ongoing uh, issue and we're always wanting to ensure, but it's about people, people's awareness of those springs as well. And that's something that's really lacking. Uh, and also a lack of understanding about the significance of springs. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a whole educational thing that needs to be considered too. Um, and also just the whole network of waterways that run throughout the city. You know, it's um, the whole, it's, it's not just the springs, it's the interconnectedness of everything. So, um, yeah, there's, there's, um, there's a lot of education that needs to occur, and I think the more that we can be more respectful and tread more lightly on the earth, the, the more that, you know, this, you know, that, that um, you know, we'll, we need to be protecting those, the springs of water, everything, the whole system. Yes, we need to change the way that we a, live. A few of us here were at a symposium up in Auckland on the weekend, and one of the biggest takeaways I had was that the most urgent thing we need to be experimenting with actually is ownership models. And you think about the problem of daylighting all the streams or, 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 or bringing the springs to life, or whatever, it comes down to ownership. Who owns the land? Who has a right to say, 
oh, you can't just do whatever you want with that particular, you know, so restricting some private ownerships or coming up with more communal and holistic ownership models and things. And so, I, I think, think we the, all need to be saying enough is enough. Yep. Mm. yep. <laughs> Come here. Yeah. Hi, my name's Kamiya. Um, I spend quite a bit of time thinking about ownership models. Can you, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, and one of the things I'm noticing through this talk is you, you use placemaking and public space to be synonymous. Yeah. And uh, uh, throughout the talk, and maybe that wasn't intentional, but I'm, I'm just hearing that. I'm just a little bit curious about placemaking that's collectively owned and some interesting models around that. I think people know that that's the space that I occupy right now, and I'm just curious if there's some good examples that you might talk to and some other stories you might share. Sure, yeah. Um, I mean, it, it, yeah, I think pu public space is how we've come into this conversation instead of public space advocacy. But basically we discovered that to make public spaces work, they need to become layered places where m multiple people have a sense of ownership there's public ownership and there's lots of types of ownership and obviously you know fundamental ownership of, of land is, is a key issue and access to ownership is, is, are, are, are fundamental but there's many layers of sense of ownership a sense of meaning a sense of spirit a sense of that, that are you know that are, we're all still uncovering and we need to keep uncovering so I think the process of placemaking is a sense uncovering and revealing and inviting in more more ownership um, of space uh, and, and the informality is, is key. We formalized ownership. We formalized the sense of who can own, who can control, who can shape public space um, on so many levels. And actually, I think actually water is, is offered, you know, people can't, it's, it should be a public good, just like air in a sense. It, 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 it sort of it disperses uh, ownership and, and grounds us in place and in a more connected idea of place. I always think, so how a city relates to water, how it meets the water's edge in, in Winter Quarter or River or, you know, even the Springs, is really reflects how it relates to the world, how it relates to how it respects the world. Um, but I think but it's the human elements at the water's edge. It's not just, it, we, you know, my, my, my father actually organized the first Earth Day in 1970, and I grew up around a lot of the founders of the environmental movement in the, in the States. But the environmental movement is not addressing we need to, its, its biggest challenges. And, and we think it's actually you know, again, it's these human places and how, how we show, showcase thriving human connection to water at, the, at our urban centers that I think we can really re reinvent our and respect for nature, um, mitigate its impact on it, because we want people to having to find connected experiences to, to nature. But then in these places, are, this is where we're going to develop, these are the innovation centers, these are the innovation quarters where we're going to come up with bigger solutions to, to working together, to living together on this planet. I think I'm feeling much more urgency around private spaces and transfer, you know, in the best case scenario, maybe 10, 15% of the urban environment will be public space, open space. It's probably more like 40% if you count roads as public space, something like that. Mm -hmm. But that leaves 60% of the city that the primary value is return on investment or, or something like that. And I think that's what we need to be <laughs> challenging. Yeah, in the middle. Oh. oh. Sorry, you can go now. Just a question for Ethan, please. Um, the importance of a public market space in the city. I know um, Ryan was spoken about that uh, previously. Um, I'd just like to hear some thoughts around that. Um, definitely. So I love public markets and water. It's a great, great question. Thank you. Um, so, so I, whenever I go to a city, I feel like I want to find the public market because that's where you find the soul of a city. How, how a city relates to water, how it relates to food. These are, these are deep, deeply connected places and really cities first formed as public markets, often at a water's edge or so forth. Um, and uh, where they've gone wrong is where they've become less like public markets. Uh, in, a, in a public market, everybody's competing to contribute to shared value, to place, to each other's connection, to, they're making eye contact, the best displays, the most friendly vendors. Um, they're, they're placemakers at, at their essence. 
Um, you know, where cities go wrong is where each development, each retail is, venue is competing to take value, to take shared value from the public realm, this, this sort of taker culture, uh, this very formal culture. Uh, markets are, are, you know, need work when they're, they're at the heart of public goal, very informal about public acted action, but they incubate businesses, they incubate culture, they preserve culture. Uh, the best cities, we ran a public markets conference in Barcelona with you and Habitat and others. Uh, public markets, there's, are, there's 42 or three of them in Barcelona, one at, within a 10 minute walk of everybody. They're the anchors of, of each neighborhood's beautiful buildings. Uh, and uh, you know, these, these, can be, you can, these can be the anchors of your, your community gathering places. Uh, we have another conference coming up in London on, on, on public markets. And uh, so it's a great way to seed a place, to regenerate a place, to support local food culture, your connection to the, to the earth and, and, and agriculture and the environment. Um, but most importantly, the social connection and the, and the cultural connection as well. Mm -hmm. Any other thoughts on that? If my colleague Connie Clarkson were here, she was okay. talking about the importance of food. If there's one thing that brings us human beings together, it's food. So that kind of food strategy and how are you thinking about local food economies and mm -hmm. the resilience around that topic is a massive, massive piece of that puzzle as well, I think, what local markets can do in terms of that. Yeah, the best way to see the place is through food. W William White was the mentor of Project Public Spaces, so mm. he said, put out food, people mm. follow. I feel like there are also spaces... Sorry, if I could just uh, follow on from that, um, it was a bit of a leading question. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, in about three or four weeks' time, I'm going to open up a night market on the old Red Bus uh, workshop site in the city. Um, and it's a project I've been working on for some time. Um, I'm looking for some assistance uh, for that. I've been able to talk to people uh, after this uh, presentation. And um, yeah. Uh, Look forward to seeing that. Awesome. <laughs> You're all Yay. in. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Front row. And then that lady up the back. She's been more uh, to, to sort of continue that, the, 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 the conversation there, it wasn't until the audience questions where I felt that um, the more political angle of, of placemaking started to come in. And it was quite interesting that you could talk for an hour without really addressing where food comes from, how waste is dealt with, how people move around the city. And I wonder if there's a danger with placemaking that it becomes really neutral in terms of its language when we're in this like five to 10, you know, international emergency with climate change. And placemaking is about how people move around, where food comes from, all those things are really integral to the making places work. And there's the danger, I think there's the danger in the way that it talks that um, it becomes a service to capital. It's like it's working as placemaking because people want to build and develop, which is yeah. great. But we need to be really sensitive about what the world we're making more broadly and, and the sort of political things of infrastructure. So I, I guess my question is how, is the neutral thing a tool that you're unable to get into places that you might not otherwise if you're ex too explicit? Or do you think there's a danger it can then get captured and we lose track of what's really important and sort of urgent? I think, that's a, I think it's a big issue and a big risk. And thank you for, for asking mm. that question. Because, yeah, I mean, we, we've been continually... Uh, challenged very helpfully by Neil McEnroy who's in the back there and, um, and has been part of most, most of these conversations this week to look at f fundamentally how the economy's not working for everybody, it's, it's, uh, it, it's, it's not working for the environment for sure, and yes, placemaking can be used to just say everything's okay, we don't need to address it, but it also can be used to create the systemic change necessary. So if we're not, it, we need to connect place shaping with economy shaping and make sure we're inventing, you know, it, it's a catalyst for reinventing our economy um, in a way that, you know, that, that respects nature, you know, builds in a more inclusive, uh, but also a more creative, thrivable world. Uh, so, I mean, Neil can help us answer this mm -hmm. and he's gonna be around uh, this week. He runs the Center for Local Economic Strategies in, in Manchester, uh, UK. Um, and, uh, and has, has been helping us, us all this week in, in, in Auckland you know, really think more deeply about these issues, which is really important. I you said a little bit to yeah, that too. Um, so place is food, and that's the point we really want to make, is that actually the place that we live in uh, can actually sustain the growth of food. And if we look after our environment, it can produce food. So, you know, if we're doing these things, well, you know, the place itself is about food. And that's why we live here. 
you know, it's why Christchurch uh, was settled, it's why uh, this was an important mahanga kai for Ngāi Tuhiriri Ngāi Tahu. It's because it was a wealth of natural resources once upon a time. And, you know, when we're trying to bring people back, we talk about the importance of water and natural springs and, and all of our, um, you know, all of our natural systems. You know, if, if we can connect ourselves back to place, we're connecting ourselves back to the original Mahanga Kai, the original food of this place as well, and it just highlights the importance of us to be better custodians, to be better kaitiaki, and, and actually, you know, um, and start to, you know, respect, build a deeper level of respect for that natural environment around us. So, you know, that's really place, it comes down to food. Yeah. I guess for me, the uh, political element of our, of our work, uh, addressing some of the big issues that are facing us as a society, we, I mean, we don't come close to having the answers right now. We have a real failure of imagination. The world in a generation is going to be very different to what it is right now, and we can't imagine what that's, what that's going to look like or how that's going to roll out. And so I think in creating little experiences, little places where people can start to experience different ways of being that are maybe more inclusive, equitable, sociable, whatever it might be. For me, that's actually about kind of setting free the imagination and just beginning the really important process of opening us up to, to, to be able to imagine other ways of being. Mm. Yeah. I, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I think the word is sort of less and less important and it's, it's the process, it's how we do this and are we doing it out of kindness and good intent or a desire to get shots on Instagram? I think that you know we had some terribly frightening conversations in Auckland about the fact that we're talking about human extinction at one level if you look at it from one side of it. So, so I think I was thinking that the I wrote this down so it sounds smart. But the, the political element of the work for me at the moment is how we use place to best re-address our human systems and make sure they're fit for purpose because we know it ain't working. So this kind of coming at it from a small scale, more connected human, more connected to the planet, we've got to try something else and we've got to wake up to that quite quickly, as you say, but you said something very insightful. It can be something that gets you in the door that you can then enable a bigger conversation, which is, um, sometimes that's the best way in. All right, we went big and heavy and Laura still has her hand up, God. so let's <laughs> get the word in. Thank you very much, Ryan, and all the panelists. Ethan, this is a question around place governance. The Christchurch City Council has been um, really supportive of the Central City through uh, the Central City business regeneration, uh, through uh, grants, significant annual funding grants to the Central City Business Association, and they're supporting them to develop a business improvement district. Um, but a business improvement district is quite a number of blocks, which is quite a large area for our tiny little Central City. And People care most about the places that are right next to them, right on their doorstep. Destinations within a city are typically a block or a couple of blocks in scale. In scale. And so there's like, in terms of engaging local government and central government and other stakeholders to support central city regeneration, what's the appropriate scale to, and to um, try and focus efforts on? Is it like the whole central city or is it destination development within the central city. Um, I wondered if you could talk about perhaps some alternatives to business improvement districts that you're aware of. Um, ones that specifically enable community-led place management. So when the community of place have a really strong and ongoing role in activating and managing the local place. And when I say community of place, I mean that in an inclusive sense the businesses, um, the tenants, the workers, the landowners, but also the school kids who are there every Friday afternoon after school, mana whenua, local government, everyone who has a significant and ongoing interest in that place. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Well, thank you, great, great question, an important one. And you know, obviously, you know, there's no one right answer to, to these place governing questions, but it's the process of getting there. And there's so much room for innovation on this, on this topic. Um, you know, we, we, we came to place governance from realizing the limiting factor of public spaces in the U.S. was there was no management of them. And, you know, malls were basically out-competing downtowns because they were effectively better managing quasi-public space than a main street or a downtown. And so we had to set up the first business improvement districts to sort of, to, in, the, in the 1980, actually, uh, to, to sort of 
ch ch you know, to challenge that um, in the Main Street models. But these are evolving, and now the bid models, the Main Street models need to be challenged and evolve to take on bigger issues, to not just market, and, you know, the sort of the commercialism and, and such. So there's new models of community benefit districts emerging. Um, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of in this, the question of scale, though, is a really, is a really interesting one. Um, you know, people are talking about sort of politics and how, you know, uh, let's take this question bigger. There's, you know, we're, not, we're on a lack of national leadership right now globally. Uh, you know, there's a lot of, you know, good, good cases to get cities to lead. Um, but it is, it's ultimately like this district scale where sort of innovation and uh, you know, creativity is emerging and it's around the destination, the hub level. Uh, the, the social innovation hubs, cultural innovation hubs, uh, like to your library, your, uh, you know, this, this arts hub, an arts innovation hub. It's, it's, it's at this scale of sort of, you know, outside of a building, not just a building, but sort of, you know, this distance at which you can kind of see and are drawn. You know, that's ultimately there's the best governance and management happens at that level and the best self-governance happens at that level. It doesn't mean it can't be a subset of a larger business improvement district perhaps. Maybe that is the right thing to try to get businesses to be a part of, to, to, you know, and communities to take more ownership. Because council government is in a way taking too much responsibility for placemaking. It needs to be other people involved in other revenue streams, a, a broader sense of ownership and collective uh, um, you know, ownership. But make sure again the business community doesn't then block who, who's participating in this. We need more of, more of, more of everybody. Uh, so just you know, having this conversation be open, it's going to be really innovative and exciting and in, 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 in how it evolves and you know, go with it. Don't block any leadership. Go with it and keep inviting in more. Um, and then how your square is managed, you know, that's really the most important thing. How that becomes something that everyone's competing to contribute to and layer onto and experiment with. And it showcases the best of placemaking from the whole region. Build your capacity for placemaking you know, there and then and conversely back into the communities uh, and neighborhoods. Uh, but it, you know, again, the governance models that you lead, I think, are really going to help inform. And you know, this is you know for global leadership too. So it's it's small, but these are these are, these are there's going to have major ripple effects globally. Just um, I, I see the the Christchurch City Centre has probably got uh, ten districts, right? You know, the, around about ten. We've done a little bit of work with Laura um, and uh, Atakaro, uh, Christchurch Council, Christchurch NZ, looking at the whole innovation precinct and and how do we do better placemaking within the innovation precinct. You know, it suits Vodafone to be called the innovation precinct, which is great. But how do we uh, create a, a place for people? And you might have heard uh, recently, um, we've come up with uh, St. Ass of um, Litchfield Churm, which is the Salt District. Right? Uh, and, and that's a, a really a placemaking desire. And how do we create a much better sense of place? We've got a couple of uh, nice public uh, spaces that have been created as part of the master plan and we really need to bring those places to life. Um, we don't have any of the answers so I was very interested in your answer. <laughs> right? I, we're waiting for answers. So what's essentially happened is the four major property owners in that area have um, linked up with all the tenants, we're talking to all the businesses, we're involving council um, and uh, all the various stakeholders and anyone who's got good ideas of, you know, I'm very interested in your, your question of the public spaces, how do you manage those? And you need to get a balance there because if you have all these food traders, you know, who are selling like a thousand burgers and then there's scraps left everywhere and people are peeing against the buildings, right? That, that's not a good thing either, right? So we don't have the answers, but, I, but anyone that's got the answers, then you can join our group, just <laughs> um, contact Laura. And so for you, is, is something like the branding uh, a starting point to get people to... Yeah, the, the, the brand, um, you know, we've thought uh, long and hard and we've had uh, placemaking people and brand people come up with it. Really, you've just got to come up with a name that, that people identify with and identify the context of the area. Um, and, and really, we're at the start of probably, you know, a 10 to 20 to 30 year program uh, in creating placemaking for that area. And I think the way that Laura has set it up, um, that's an opportunity for probably 10 districts you know, you've got the south frame and then you've got the retail area. And we're effectively creating an identity for people to assimilate to that area. Right? And, and we're creating uh, a desire for people to want to come. And, and if we do that really well, that's good for the businesses. Cool. I was hoping to squeeze in one more question, but that ended up being quite a long answer. So I'm afraid um, getting the signals, we've got to wind up now. And are we inviting the mayor back onto the stage? Great. Let's do that then. <laughs> Go
gosh, it's such a pleasure to be able to wrap up and thank everyone for inviting such an inspiring discussion and to again thank our sponsors, um, Te Putahi, Panaku Development, Auckland, um, Auckland sorry, that went with Panaku Development, um, Razine, Christchurch City Council and Otakaro for making Ethan's visit possible. So can we thank our sponsors uh, for this evening? Um, I do want to thank Ethan for your contribution, especially just to highlight it. I tweeted um, after I started listening to you saying, listening to at EB Kent at hashtag Christchurch Conversations uh, challenges us to keep the essence of what was transitional at Gapfiller um, Chicha at Festa underscore Chicha and. <laughs> And even quoted at Pontifex, which is Pope Francis. Um, so he's going to know that you were talking about him tonight. So that's really good. Um, but what I really liked was the retweet that that inspired, which is from Denise Bijou, who we know from um, uh, these conversations of past. And she quoted Jane Jacobs, which you also quoted. But I love this quote. Trans and she was saying that transitional is regenerative mm -hmm. in its own right. And, and so this was the quote from Jane Jacobs. Intricate, intricate minglings of different uses in cities are not a form of chaos. On the contrary, they represent a complex and highly developed form of order. And I thought that was really quite neat um, in terms of the conversation, and so the conversation goes. Um, can I thank um, Frith, Debbie and Patrick for adding your voices to the conversation. Uh, I was born and raised in Christchurch. I knew nothing of the rich cultural history that preceded colonial settlement, and I didn't know much about that either. I learned about 1066 and the Battle of Hastings and King Harold got shot in the eye with an arrow. So, um, and that's really about all that I remember from my time at school in relation to history. But our history speaks to who we are as a people, you know, and our environment uh, comes from that richness of that cultural side. And I'm just going to say, where else but to tell the history of the treaty relationship in New Zealand here in Christchurch other than Victoria Square? I mean, exactly. what a perfect place to be able to complete what is only a partially told um, story in that environment. I am personally responsible for Tūranga having a Māori name only. Um, Central Library <laughs> seemed to be... <laughs> I hope there's no one from the press here. <laughs> anyway, um, no, but I'll be blamed for it anyway. But um, the, the truth is, is that Central Library, <laughs> library seemed to detract from all that... Are, is as a place. It's so much more uh, than the library that I used to go to when I was a, a child, when I had the joy of coming into town to go to the library. Um, but the gift of the name, I think, already um, had given it a much deeper meaning uh, than any English representation could do in terms of its connection with Fitaraya Cathedral Square. So I'm not sorry at all, and I love the discourse it's generated. Nobody's in any doubt that Tūranga is here in Christchurch, and uh, it is such a big part of our future. I love our city, and I, I love the fact that we debate these issues. We don't always agree. I also love the way we're emerging from the crisis that has created opportunity um, that we are exploring in this conversation tonight. But we need to know our history. It is the mirror of who we are. Mana whenua, women's suffrage, nuclear physics, the peace movement, Antarctic exploration. Our history says we are not afraid to lead the world. We are prepared to boldly go where no man or woman has ever been 
before. Sorry, I went to see William Shatner this week, so it's just on <laughs> the back of my mind. Um, I knew I'd get it in somewhere. Um, but what a legacy and um, what a platform for taking on all the challenges that our globe uh, has to confront, and that's what we've ended up having our conversation about tonight. And thank you, Barnaby. Welcome home. Hope you're back permanently soon. Um, we miss you. So thank you all for participating in the event tonight. And in terms of this weekend, Festa gives local expression to placemaking, and I invite you all to get involved in that. And I ask you to join with me to thank Ethan, our panellists, and Ryan Reynolds, who has facilitated another great Christchurch conversation. Let's keep it going. Norera tēnā koto, tēnā koto, tēnā Thank <laughs> you.